spotlighting Hawaii's leaders. We want to bring in Governor David E. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Lieutenant Governor, good morning. Thanks so much for joining us. Mayor Derek Kawakami. Thank you so much, uh, Senator, for being here. Spotlighting the issues. Where is the virus right now in our community? How much is this overall going to cost the state? How are you responding to the community's concerns? Talk about the level of citations that you guys are writing. Spotlight Hawaii with Yanji Denise and Ryan Kalei Suji on the digital platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. This episode of Spotlight Hawaii is brought to you by Chaminade University. Aloha, happy Wednesday. I'm Yenji Denise, joined, of course, by Ryan Kalei Suji, and this is Spotlight Hawaii. We are talking about travel this morning, Ryan. Some big news, of course, uh, the governor rolling out the welcome mat to uh, domestic travelers starting November 1st, and then making some news yesterday on the international front as well. So we're going straight to the source and talking, of course, to the CEO of Hawaiian Airlines. That's right. We're excited today to be talking to one of the leaders in our community, Peter Ingram, the president and CEO of Hawaiian Airlines, joining us once again this morning. Good morning, Peter. Thanks so much for being here with us this morning. Good morning and very good to be with you guys again. Thanks so much. Yeah, yesterday, Governor Ige, as Yenji was saying, uh, uh, held a press conference welcoming back international visitors and rolled out how the state will be welcoming those visitors in compliance with some of the federal regulations uh, for those travelers, uh, as well as making a few announcements about changes to the Safe Travels program. Wanted to get your thoughts overall about the uh, return of international travel here coming up in just a few weeks. Sure. Well, first of all, I was pleased to see um, the governor's announcement yesterday, uh, a couple of weeks ago, the federal government announced uh, new policies for foreign nationals traveling um, to the United States. So it's going to require uh, essentially every foreign national coming into the U.S. to be vaccinated and to get a, uh, a COVID test within three days. And that COVID test can be, uh, can be an antigen test. And I thought it was important that we aligned our policies in Hawaii with those federal rules. So we weren't confusing travelers with one set of rules for entry into the United States, another set of rules for entry into Hawaii, particularly since everyone is going to, uh, to be vaccinated. Uh, I think the federal rules are are good, and um, I'm glad we clarified that uh, that yesterday. And I, I think that's a positive for us um, going forward. Um, as as I think about where we are in terms of of international recovery, uh, we're at we're really at the beginning of the beginning. I think, and um, if you think about places that are big sources of visitors to Hawaii, particularly Japan, which is by far um, the largest international source, but also Australia, uh, Korea, South Korea. Um, the, the vaccination rates over the past several months have improved incredibly in those places. They were all well behind um, the United States. Um, they all have a fully vaccinated rate ahead of the US average now. Um, they are more in the range of where we are in Hawaii with about 70% of people or more fully vaccinated uh, in the high 70s or close to 80% with at least one dose. And so the conditions are falling into place for um, more of an international travel recovery at this point. Uh, what we really need now that we've got the policy, a clear policy framework here in Hawaii and in the United States, is to see some of the uh, policy restrictions that exist in Japan and in Australia and other places relaxed on the other end of the route. And um, we think with vaccination rates up, with COVID cases down, that the environment is set for that. But we haven't um, seen all of those policy changes happen yet, although we did recently have uh, have policy changes in Australia that's allowing us to um, to restart our Sydney route five times a week starting in mid-December. And that is exciting. That's obviously a key part of our international base as well. Um, Heidi has a question. If we're at the beginning of the beginning, when do we anticipate the full return of key international markets? I know you don't have a crystal ball there, but um, <laughs> how long do you think that that recovery will take? Yeah, I've been looking for that crystal ball for about a year and a half now, and I can't find it in this conference room. Um, 
Yeah, what, what, what we're uh, anticipating is that, that we will start to see policy restriction, uh, policy changes coming soon. As I said, Australia just happened a few weeks ago. We announced uh, an expansion of our schedule there. Um, Japan, in the last few days, has started to gradually make some policy changes around uh, international business travel. Uh, we're hopeful that that is uh, a leading indicator of policy changes regarding uh, Japanese leisure travel, which is what obviously is important for us in Hawaii. Our anticipation is that um, those policy changes could be just around the corner and we'd start ramping up either right at the end of this year or in the first quarter of next year and begin to gradually restore our schedule to um, Japan over the course of the first quarter and into the second quarter. And then by um, by the end of the second quarter, so as we get into summertime next year, that we would see uh, Japan operations, at least for Hawaiian Airlines, uh, back to where we were in 2019 with a uh, a full schedule and multiple cities and daily flights to um, to multiple cities in Japan. Obviously, that's that's speculation at this point, and that's that's a planning scenario we're working on. Uh, but but we think that's the sort of time frame that is the base case assumption for us to work off of. One of the things that the governor made clear yesterday and announced uh, and repeated a few times yesterday was that the international. Uh, carriers were going to be responsible for helping to screen to make sure that the passengers are vaccinated, that they uh, do follow these, um, per, you know, these foreign and, and these uh, for this foreign travel, that they, they follow the policies that are set into place. Uh, talk about how that is for you folks setting that up, uh, the infrastructure that is needed, and how will that process look like for those travelers who are coming from an international destination and making sure that some of those vaccine verifications are in place and that the testing also mechanisms are also there? Yeah, we're, we're, we're working through the implementation of that right now. That is um, actually part of um, the U.S. federal government's requirements is that the, the air carriers, before people get on the airplane, um, validate um, uh, the proof of vaccination, uh, the proof of getting a test within um, 72 hours of travel, and also collect um, some um, certain elements of contact tracing information um, that we would have to make available to the CDC if that were required, if there were uh, were any COVID cases that would require um, contact tracing to happen. So we've had those federal requirements uh, in our hands uh, for a little while. We're, um, we're laying out how we will implement that. Uh, the process is likely to um, start off being fairly manual. And one of the things we've got to work through is the documentation we'll be looking at can differ from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Japan's will look a little different than uh, Korea's will look a little different than Australia's. Uh, but we, we would hope to move from that sort of manual environment um, that is um, adding some transactions at the airport to seeing how how well we can collect that information either electronically or further um, further in advance understanding a lot of it's going to come just before travel there were a lot of folks who were in the tourism industry who were really hoping that the governor would roll out that welcome act to domestic visitors uh, sooner than he did but he did make it of course for november 1st which was earlier this week what kind of a difference does that message send are you seeing after he made that announcement did you see an uptick in bookings um and what are you anticipating for the holiday season we we've seen a little bit of an uptake since the the governor made his recent statements but um but to be honest um, you, you know, our cases or our bookings um, domestically have largely been inversely related to um, the level of COVID cases in, um, in the U.S. overall. And so we saw bookings decline in early August, even before the governor um, suggested people should stay away from Hawaii for a while. Um, that accelerated and we did see some cancellations when the governor made his initial statement um, that it wasn't a good time to come to Hawaii. But by the end of September, we had already seen, started to see some recovery as people felt more comfortable as COVID cases were coming down. That's accelerated uh, over the last um, six or eight weeks. 
Uh, and then we got a little bump when the governor made his statement. But I, I think a lot of it has to do as much with um, how people feel about the risk of the virus when they're resuming the activities that they want to resume uh, as much as um, the policy statements that uh, come out of Governor Ige or, or others. So it's helped accelerate that trend. We're seeing a good level of bookings. It's not as strong as the bookings were in um, June and July, but it's um, we're on a recovery path from where we were in August, where things were had really slowed down pretty considerably. You know, speaking of that summer surge that we saw with the domestic travelers, many of whom were coming to Hawaii because of a lack of opportunities to really go anywhere else, Hawaii became that primary destination. And, and there was a little bit of tension between local residents as well as those visitors. Uh, and there was a call by many local residents to educate these visitors uh, when coming to Hawaii about some of the things that they should be aware of. And one of the things that Hawaiian Airlines did was uh, release a very timely video that helps to educate uh, those who are coming into the state. If you can talk a little bit more about that video specifically uh, and at large the travel uh, Pono program that you folks have uh, initiated and set into place. Yeah, as, as you say, it's part of uh, the um, travel Pono program that we've introduced over the course of the last year as we've begun welcoming uh, more people um, back to the islands. And, and I, I think probably more than any other um, carrier serving the islands, we've got sensitivity around the local concerns because we are here, we're living in the community, um, we, are, we are part of the community. Uh, so we, we felt it was important to put the message out um, to our guests in our voice and share with them some of the concerns um, that, that we know are uh, existing in the community about um, how people interact with our environment and our people when they are here in Hawaii. Um, we did it by, with the, the recent video you're talking about, and I, I thought our team did a, uh, it was really well done how they put this together. We had um, some employees of our company uh, who are full-time regular jobs, pilots, flight attendants with our company, um, but also serve uh, in their, um, their own time in different roles, whether it's um, as cultural practitioners, uh, as uh, people working in um, around um, beach safety uh, and and supporting uh, that as as lifeguards, and so we had these people talk about their real experiences on the video and what the expectations are that um, you should be careful when you're going on a hike that you know where you are that you should be mindful of the fact um, that. Um, when you see a beach in a backyard, it's our backyard. And we want people to be respectful of that when they're here. And, and we, we tried to do it in a way that is not, um, you know, finger wagging or shaming, but, but really appeal to um, the sensitivities of our guests to just be respectful of the, of the environment, be respectful of the people in our community when they come to Hawaii. And uh, we've really been pleased to see um, the response to it. I think it's been uh, really well received um, by our guests. And I, I've seen you know coverage of it in the local media. And I think people uh, appreciate that we're trying to get um, that message out to people in, a, in the right way. You know, you mentioned that the bookings are really related to the COVID cases uh, where they're first being booked. And one of the things that the federal government had discussed at some point was the possibility of mandating the vaccine for things like air travel to hopefully help to boost vaccination right, rates and also to make it safer to fly. Um, is that still part of the conversation? I know that that's not necessarily up to you. Obviously, that would be something that would come from the federal government. But is that still something that is being considered as far as you know? It, it isn't something I've heard as much about over the last um, few weeks. This was part of the, the conversation uh, a while ago when there were some uh, federal leaders that had suggested that, that they might advocate for that. Um, what, what we've said on this subject or what I've said on this subject is uh, it's, it's very difficult for uh, an individual airline to be able to uh, impose something like this on our guests because we do um, operate under certificates of public convenience. We do provide a 
uh, a public service. And even if you're going to have a vaccination requirement for some activity, um, there has to be a way to manage um, exceptions. And, you know, under our laws, there are reasonable accommodations that have to be provided for medical reasons or for religious um, reasons. So um, doing that for the public is something I think the federal government would have to be the decider on that, and they would have to figure out a way to implement it. Implementation, I think, would be very, very difficult when you think of the volume of people um, traveling every day. So uh, I, I think it would be very complex to get there. I know there are some people who would advocate for it. One of the things I would remind people is throughout the pandemic, even before we had vaccinations, uh, even when cases were much, much higher than they are today, air travel has been incredibly safe. And it's incredibly safe for a, a lot of reasons, but a, and part of it is the air circulation. This is an airborne virus, as we all know now. Um, the air circulation on an airplane is constantly bringing in fresh air from the outside. Anything that gets recirculated is going through high efficiency filters like they have in hospitals. And so we really haven't seen incidents of spread in aircraft anywhere in the world uh, on meaningful scale during the entire pandemic. So uh, I do think travel is, um, is safe, uh, even if we don't have 100% of people in the environment vaccinated. And, and certainly as cases are coming down, uh, I think it's great for people to have the opportunity to get out and start enjoying some of the things that haven't been as accessible over the last uh, year and a half or so. One of the things, unfortunately, that we have seen uh, with airlines, uh, not, uh, you know, not only Hawaiian Airlines, but throughout the country is the number of in-flight incidences that are happening uh, with passengers getting disgruntled and causing, you know, with getting into confrontations with sometimes uh, other passengers, sometimes with flight attendants and other staff uh, of airlines. I wanted to get your thoughts over about uh, what that what the environment is like right now and, and what's happening and what maybe could be done to help to uh, limit these types of uh, incidents from happening in, in our airways. Yeah, we, we, we've certainly been hearing about these more. And um, we had uh, a couple of incidents, including uh, one on our uh, flight where uh, where a flight attendant was um, struck completely unprovoked by um, by a guest um, traveling on the airplane. Um, I, I, I will say uh, I've traveled uh, a fair bit over the last six months. And by and large, um, you know, really every flight I've been on has been a normal flight with um, people, you know, behaving normally and no incidents of this sort. So it's still very much the exception. Um, but it's happening too often. And I can't put my finger on exactly what the cause is. Um, but I can tell you, um, we simply can't tolerate it. It, it is not um, behavior that is acceptable anywhere in society. It certainly isn't behavior that we can accept uh, in a confined um, space uh, with a lot of people um, from uh, the public in the environment. And, and you know, safety is the cornerstone of everything we do in our business. And we look at this as uh, an incident, as incidents that um, infringe on the potential safety of our guests and our employees. And uh, we're, I'm pleased, uh, the one thing I am pleased about that is coming out of this is it's really heightened some awareness about these incidents, which have happened on an isolated basis uh, over time. Uh, it has gotten us to the point where we're seeing greater support from the FAA and from law enforcement officials when we report something that happened in flight. Uh, it's really important that that gets followed up on when we get back on the ground, um, that if people are perpetrating um, these events, um, they ought to be prosecuted. Um, this is a serious uh, event and, and you know, we're going to continue to advocate for that on behalf of our guests and on behalf of our employees who shouldn't have to tolerate that sort of behavior. 
You've been kind enough to join us throughout the pandemic. And I know that at the start, uh, at some points in our interviews, you, you know, you, the Hawaiian, you said, was losing over $3 million a day. Then I think we talked and it was around one. And the last time, I believe it was sort of, you know, breaking even, but not, you know, may, maybe making a little, but certainly not enough. How are you doing? How is the airline doing financially? Um, and what kind of a difference, uh, you know, will this holiday season make for the bottom line? Yeah, we're, we're still um, recording losses. We released our third quarter financial uh, re results uh, a week or so ago. Uh, we, we still recorded um, some pretty sizable losses in that period, but well down from uh, where we were a year ago. Uh, our, we're financially, uh, we are in a sense in a comfortable position in that we have raised um, we have issued debt and raised cash to make sure we've got more than enough liquidity to get us to the other side of this crisis. And that puts us in a position where we can continue to invest in the future. Uh, we're anticipating our 787 airplanes coming next year. We're not um, looking to defer that anymore. We want to get those airplanes. We're anticipating a recovery. Uh, for us, a big part of getting back to full profitability is getting the international part of the business back. Uh, by July, we had seen domestic uh, recover very strongly, particularly from the U.S. Uh, mainland, but also seen some recovery here in uh, flying within uh, the state. Uh, that took a setback with the Delta variant uh, over the last couple of months. But as we see the bookings recover, we're confident um, that we're going to get back uh, to where we were in, um, in summer on that in terms of demand levels. International is, was 25% of our revenue before the pandemic. And over the last um, several quarters, 95% um, of that has been missing. Um, so we really need to get that part of the business going. I'm encouraged that'll happen over the course of uh, the next couple of quarters. And by the time we're into um, summer of next year, um, we should have a fully functioning, uh, profitable business again, or at least be in a position uh, where if we execute and do the things we need to do as a business, um, we've got the environment that allows us to succeed. You know, one of the most used words uh, in 2020 was the word pivot. And we heard many businesses saying that they had to pivot in the way that they operate, in the way that their overall business plan was in order to survive during the pandemic. Uh, and, and just wanted to get your thoughts on what some of Pivot's Hawaiian Airlines uh, has had to make, or maybe the pandemic allowed an opportunity to kind of reassess some of these routes. We know that during the pandemic, you started routes to Austin, uh, to uh, Orlando, Florida. You also added on there and Ontario, California. Uh, what other changes do you think uh, could be made or, or will be coming for Hawaiian Airlines and, and things that you have learned through this pandemic uh, that might steer the company in a different direction? Yeah, I, I think one of the things that has happened in, in our business uh, is um, the, the pandemic was an unsettling event um, for demand. It sort of um, rocked everyone um, back. And then as people come back into place, it does change some of the competitive um, dynamics of the markets they've served. I think it forces you to um, look at, you know, what have you been doing? Is it really successful enough? Do you want to go back and uh, and do that when demand uh, recovers? Uh, you know, for us, you mentioned the the new um, cities we added to the network. Those were things um, that we had on our list for the long term, but we accelerated into them while we have uh, the international part of our business missing for a period of time. Um, we, we expect all of those um, new routes to continue to be part of our network going forward. Um, one of the things I'm um, eager to see as we, uh, I'm certainly eager to see a demand recovery from Japan, but as we do see a uh, demand recovery in Japan, I, I am curious to, um, to find out whether we're going to see some changes in the competitive dynamic there that may create opportunities for us, that may create some, uh, some incremental challenges. Uh, Japan's such an important part uh, for us going forward. Um, I, I think one of the other things I would say is uh, it's really heightened for me how important it is um, to 
be communicating with people. Uh, and, you know, in the times of uncertainty we've been going through, whether it's communicating with our employees, communicating with our guests, communicating with people in the community, I, I, I think if we learn a lesson from this, one of them should be um, we should keep those open lines of communication going all the time, even in periods of less uncertainty. And, and it's, it's proven really valuable uh, to, to us uh, to do that. And, and I would um, hope that that's one of the, the differences we'll have going forward. I want to ask you about employment opportunities. Uh, the job market has seen so many fluctuations, and I know that early on you had to make a number of tough decisions to furlough and lay folks off. Um, where are you in that process now, and are there are there jobs open at Hawaiian? Yeah, we're hiring, and we're hiring um, pretty much across the board. Uh, if, uh, if you are trained as a pilot and would like to be a pilot, we're accepting applications. We are, um, we're hiring flight attendants, we're hiring mechanics, we're hiring people to work at our uh, airports, and we're hiring people to work here in our corporate offices. So uh, it is, uh, it's great for us after going through that period uh, a year ago where we were um, downsizing and contracting to be back to the point where we are anticipating growth. We're anticipating the recovery, as we've talked about, of the international part of our business. And we did have some folks who have left our business over the, the last um, year or so. And um, we have needs for for more people. So uh, it's it's a great time to uh, to be if people are looking for work, there's uh, there's opportunities all over. And certainly there's plenty of opportunities here at Hawaiian Airlines. This happened a few months ago, but we haven't had the opportunity to speak to you since then. But wanted to just get uh, your thoughts of um, Hawaiian Airlines' role in the, uh, uh, the transportation of Afghan refugees during the time when the U.S. was uh, removing their presence there in that country. Uh, Hawaiian Airlines was one of the airlines that stepped up and, and was chosen to help through that process. If you can talk to us a little more about that whole experience overall and uh, Hawaiian Airlines' involvement. Yeah, so th this is um, something called the Civil Reserve Air Fleet or CRAF. And, and under CRAF, um, we pledge when um, the federal government, the Department of Defense, uh, has a need for um, civil airlift um, that we have a couple of aircraft that we will provide uh, if they call on us. And in, I think, 60 years of operating this program, we've only been called on um, three times. Um, Previously was troop movements uh, uh, associated with activities uh, in the Middle East in the early 90s and the, and the 2000s. Um, in this case, uh, our employees and our aircraft were used to help transport um, refugees from the Afghanistan evacuation um, to points in um, the United States, moving them uh, from when they entered the country on the East Coast into points in the middle of, uh, of the country where they're going to start their new life. I will tell you, having read um, the testimonials from um, some of our employees who participated in, um, in these missions, um, they, will, they will never forget um, the experience um, that they went through and the, the gratitude that they felt from people who were rescued from such a def desperate situation and were embarking on a new life uh, here in the United States. I think for the people who got to participate in it, it was really a, a life-changing experience. And there's some uh, wonderful stories um, that they would tell far better than, um, than I ever could of the interactions they had um, with these people who had come from a situation of such despair. And uh, it's, it's gratifying for us as, uh, as a company and as a member of a broader community to be able to help out in a time of need like this and figure a way that, um, that we can use the resources that we have available to, um, to provide a service um, to people in such a difficult time. Yeah, those pictures were incredible coming out of Afghanistan. I want to ask you, we're almost out of time, but the governor is heading to Scotland today. It's his first international trip. I think it's his first trip out of Hawaii since the pandemic. 
Um, what would you say, not to us who necessarily are gonna go to Scotland, but what do you say to travelers or to, to Kama Aina who are considering travel? You know, so many of us, myself included, have been gun shy about getting on an airplane, uh, but now we're making holiday plans. What is it like to travel right now? And what would you say to folks as they make their plans uh, for the holidays and beyond? Yeah, well, well, first of all, I know the governor is traveling uh, for very important um, climate conferences going on. And perhaps in one of our uh, future discussions, one of the things we can talk about is um, what Hawaiian Airlines is um, doing to reduce our environmental uh, footprint over time. Um, but as far as it goes for um, for travel and the question um, you asked, um, what, what, what I would say, having traveled a few times myself, is, um, you know, be prepared for um, things to be a, a little different. Um, be a little bit um, patient because there are a lot of people um, just like the governor or just like you who maybe hasn't traveled as much in the last couple of years. And I think there are still some people who have uh, a fair bit of anxiety about getting into public places and interacting um, with a lot of people as you necessarily do while you travel. Uh, but um, it is, at least in my case, uh, having uh, been on the mainland um, several times over the last few months, uh, it is a great reminder when you do have the opportunity to travel um, to uh, of why we enjoy traveling so much and the benefits of interacting with different people and different experiences and different communities and how that can um, be so invigorating for all of us. And it, it's why that there is this pent up demand for leisure travel because people really do uh, enjoy it and miss it and they wanna get out and do it, whether it's coming to Hawaii or traveling from Hawaii for those of us uh, who live here. So um, the, the experience though, I, I think we're trying to make it as welcoming as possible in um, the airports. You, you need to remember everyone's uh, wearing a face covering and we've got um, protocols in place, but we're we're trying to make it as uh, as normal as we can appropriate for the circumstances we're living in today. All right, Peter Ingram from Hawaiian Airlines, thank you so much for taking time this morning to join us and giving us an update on what's happening over there at Hawaiian Airlines. We really appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Aloha. Good talking to you again. Nice to speak with you. Aloha. Wow. Well, I would love to hop on a plane right now and get a change of scenery. I, I think that he's right. So many of us would love to have, you know, just those experiences outside of our Hawaii bubble. And it would be nice to get to the mainland or beyond the governor, as we mentioned, traveling to Scotland today for the climate conference. Um, and I'm sure we'll be talking about that in the coming days. Great to hear from uh, Peter Ingram about the changes coming for international travel. And it sounds like there will be uh, a lot of new business uh, once the protocols on the other side change. But of course, he has no control over that. Yeah. And, you know, you can hear that sense of optimism as they look forward to the international travel. Peter Ingram actually saying that uh, it's a key component as part of their overall business plan and that while domestic travel has helped to carry the company during uh, those summer months that we saw and also through their expansions through some of these new routes uh, during this past year, uh, really the international travel is such a key part of Hawaiian Airlines and their viability and their success overall, uh, specifically Japan. And so uh, he expects that some of those changes uh, on the international front and the quarantine measures and the rules that are in place on the international side uh, could be changing soon, which would only free up more opportunities for uh, local residents as well as other Hawaii, uh, US citizens to travel abroad. Yeah, he did say in the last quarter, they did report last week that they are still losing money, but of course not at the levels they were, let's say, a year ago. Um, and that because they are what he thinks is in a strong financial position and projecting many positive gains for the future, they're hiring at all levels from the corporate side to pilots all the way to uh, flight attendants and cargo. You know, If you want a job at Hawaiian and you're in that sector, it sounds like there could be one there for you. Yeah, and also great to hear from him about the Travel Pono program that Hawaiian Airlines is really pushing. We saw that video come out. If you have not had the opportunity to watch it, uh, I suggest you watch it. It is very well done. I know that many people feel that that video should be on every island. I mean, excuse me, on every airplane. 
uh, even though Hawaiian Airlines produced it. Uh, but it it really does uh, paint a good picture, I think, of what many in the community were calling for and asking for uh, with uh, with regards to some of the specific things that happened here in Hawaii, the rules, uh, as well as just the cultural practices that happen here that really it's done in a tasteful way. And you can he you heard from him here this morning uh, of just his overall um, you know, commitment and the airline's commitment to seeing that that continues to happen moving forward. Yeah, they are expecting more visitors, of course, for the holiday season, but not at the levels that we saw in the summer. I think that a lot of Kamaina probably appreciate that, not necessarily, uh, you know, from a financial perspective, but just there was this surge and it caught a lot of folks off guard. So we are anticipating a return of travel as we usually get uh, during the winter months, but not at the levels we've seen over the summer. Switching gears on Friday, we're going to be speaking with Anton Krucki. He, of course, is heading up the city's homelessness uh, initiative and the core program. Uh, we've talked about that on this program in the past. This is a, essentially a response program to try to address the folks who are chronically homeless and in need of serious services to get them out of this sort of rotation of going to the emergency room and then getting right back on the street. How do we break that cycle? How do we get these folks the services they need? The city is pouring in millions of dollars of those ARPA funds uh, that came with the pandemic relief. So they've got that in place now, I believe, for about a month. And we'll see how that program is going. I think that there are a lot of people who are very invested and in hoping that that will gain results. Yeah, looking forward to getting that update uh, and, and hearing more about how the cities will be managing that because we know that that continues to be uh, a very big problem here in the city and county of Honolulu. We look forward to seeing you there. Thanks so much for tuning in this morning. We'll see you right back here on Friday at 1030. Aloha. Aloha. This episode of Spotlight Hawaii was brought to you by Chaminade University.